Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sabine Anasundaram. Um, we are starting this CAST-based uh, informational for everybody who's listening in from FETNA. Um, I think we can go around. We have a panel here. We're just going to talk about a few issues about CAST. Uh, I'll say an intro, but before the intro, um, everybody can introduce themselves. Hi, Vanakam. Uh, my name is Madhavi, um, and I am currently, I just finished my third year of medical school, and I'm doing my master's in public health at George Washington University, and I'm originally from Maryland, um, and currently I'm in the D.C. area. Vanakam, I'm Bharti um, Caldwell. I am a senior in college. I'm a business administration major, minoring in psychology at the University of Texas of Dallas, and I've been in Dallas all my life. Um, I'm Inyal. I'm a high school senior from Harford County, Maryland, and I've always lived in Maryland. Uh, uh, my name is Aditya. Uh, I'm from the University of Minnesota, Duluth, and yeah, I've lived in Minnesota all my life. And I'm Sidi Nasadaram, like I said before. Um, I am from Maryland. I graduated from Virginia Tech, uh, studying finance, and I work in venture capital. Um, to get started, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of background about why we're holding this information and then informational, and then we're going to go into questions. With the recent lawsuit by state of, by the state of California against Cisco Systems, as well as accusations of caste-based discrimination by the BAPS organization in the U.S. and subsequent federal inquiries, we at FETNA thought it would be best to have a short talk about caste-based discrimination in the U.S. While we may not be very familiar with caste-based discrimination as first and second generation Indian Americans, most of us Indian Americans and Sri Lankan Americans um, clearly carry the privilege of being oblivious of it. To preface the talk, I just want to say this is informal and we do not have any experts, nor do we have many experts in the U.S. in general. The folks at Equality Labs do great work and I highly recommend visiting their website and reading their reports. Just to give an overview of why we don't have experts, Tamil Nadu has about 20% of its population of Dalits and Adivasi, but they're estimated to only be around 1.5% in the U.S. Most of the Indians and Americans are from dominant or upper caste and come from some level of privilege. We're going to start with a few questions. Um, I'm going to start it with, um, what is caste and what is caste-based privilege? So I guess I can start. Um, so I guess I define caste by the, the quote by Dr. Ambedkar, which is, an artificial chopping, an artificial chopping off of the population into fixed and definite units, each one prevented from fusing one another through the custom of endogamy. So I guess in my own words, I'd label that as graded inequality, as in you can't mix within caste, which is why the caste system is so strong, because you have this caste pride and your ability to be within your community and feel safe within that community. And for me, caste privilege, I look at it in three ways. The first way is having connections and opportunities and like guaranteed, almost guaranteed jobs if you're from India or even if you're from an upper caste or middle caste community here in America. Second way is the ability to live without fear, as in you don't have to fear somebody asking for your last name and then being looked down upon or having to worry about, oh, if I use this person's utensil or that person's utensil, that I'll get yelled at. And the final way is the ability to unsee caste, as in you can just live your life without ever, have to, ever having to worry about, you know, where you're from or who your family is. And also the ability to just, how do I say this, be able to just fight back if anybody says anything against your caste or says something about you, they're from a lower caste. The ability, the ability to just fight back and not have to worry about consequences, so. All right, if that's it, we're going to move on to the next question. Do you guys think that there is caste-based discrimination in the U.S.? So I think there's actually been quite a long history of caste-based discrimination in the U.S. So beginning all the way with the Immigration Act of 1924, which um, actually first introduced the first challenges to Indian immigrant citizenship in America, and unfortunately, the arguments of Indian immigrants um, at that time were firmly rooted in caste. 
Um, famously, the first cases um, were brought up by A.K. Mazumdar and Bhagat Singh Pind, both of whom argued that they passed the whiteness test because they identified themselves as, quote, high caste Hindu of full Indian blood. Um, so they explained that because of their upper caste um, and pure Aryan blood, um, that those racial origins were something that they historically shared um, with Caucasians, um, making them deserving of American citizenship. Um, and in fact, it is this exact racialized perception of caste, um, anti beliefness anti-Adivasiness um, that then sets the stage for anti-Blackness within our South Asian American community. Um, throughout South Asian immigrant history, we find um, several instances of upper caste South Asians um, being eager to associate themselves with whiteness and dissociate themselves from blackness. Um, and this even includes famously Gandhi, um, who considered himself to be upper caste and was um, famously anti-black um, during his time as an immigrant in South Africa. Yeah, um, so to just add on a little bit about that, I definitely think there is still caste-based discrimination in the United States. Um, while discrimination is like not as direct as seen in our history, I would say, we see it through various forms, um, such as like the marriage marketing system that we have um, in our society today. So many parents still emphasize the importance of wanting to get married within a caste. And um, so the uh, specific community's legacy is built upon. So personally, this is like mind blowing to me because we're like in the 21st um, century and to some extent, like wanting to marry like the same race or ethnicity is kind of frowned upon in a way. So taking that to a whole new level of like wanting to get married to a particular cast, um, it's just like mind blowing, I would say. Um, and we see this in so many forms, like there are like certain caste gatherings and such that happen. And at these caste gatherings that happen, people are scouting out individuals to um, get married to. So it's just all in all, like very, I think disappointing that this is still going on, but yeah. I think that leads us to our next question, which is, do you think it is only prevalent in the immigrant community or do you think some level of the caste discrimination has been passed to the next generation as well. I think marriage is one of the first points, but do you guys see any other areas where it's been passed on? Yeah, so I think within our generation, especially, um, I have noticed that um, we carry forward a lot of microaggressions. Um, so slight snubs that, you know, implicitly suggest that you don't belong here or that, you know, you are not welcome here. Um, and just some examples that I've heard of and seen, especially within the college community is um, people saying that they would not room um, with someone who is of a lower caste or even more subtle things like um, not being willing to use the same utensils or dishes as someone um, who they deem as lower caste. And um, for anyone that knows that is, you know, textbook untouchability, that is, um, actually what is deemed as illegal in the Indian constitution um, and considered to be untouchability. And it's quite astonishing to me that people have decided to carry that across the ocean here um, and continue to do that. And I, I think to a certain extent, there are people within our generation um, who don't fully understand that what they're doing is actually untouchability. But, you know, if, if you are unwilling to share, you know, utensils that have been washed and cleaned in a dishwasher or plates have, that have been washed and cleaned in dishwasher, and you're not willing to share that with someone, um, that is a form of untouchability. I think also to add on to that, um, you know, there's a lot of times I think as a second generation immigrant or first generation immigrant, um, it's, it's easy to say, oh, you know, my parents, this is something my parents carried um, with them, but it doesn't really matter to me. Um, but I think like a big discussion um, with caste, it comes down to in my in my life has been um, within the South Indian classical um, 
world in the Carnatic music world um you know in the states we have a lot of um, South Asian kids who train in dance and music um and we have things like the Cleveland Thyagaraja Aradhana um which often from the outside seem like beautiful celebrations of culture but deep down inside they're very very um organized ways of perpetuating um caste privilege um and I think you know I'm I'm Sri Lankan Tamil um and so I kind of always fly under the radar um but even kids my age um they're so used to you know, kids in their music class, kids in their programs, kids who win the competitions, who get to perform in certain situations, being of higher caste or the same caste as them. Um, I've sat in rooms where I've silently agreed with everyone being like, yes, I'm also vegetarian. Yes, my parents also do this um, because people simply were just not aware that um, I didn't have parents who were of the same caste or of the same standing that theirs were um, and it's so it kind of is is passed on and and even though they don't explicitly understand it as bias or privilege um, it definitely plays a big role in um in kids my age and you know the forward i guess progress of uh south indian classical dance and music in america um, you know there's big discussions about people who win and who get promoted by those programs as well um, it's not rid and people who are of lower caste don't always get the same opportunity and are not seen um, the same way and often have to do twice as much work in order to be promoted and seen as um, you know valid by mainstream audience i think to add on we also see some of these microaggressions as Madhavi said earlier um, in even things like the media by people that were born in America. Um, as an example, uh, Padma Lakshmi and Aziz go on a trip to India and they go to South, they go to South India and they they say that most of South India, most of Tamil Nadu is vegetarian, which is just, and Aziz agrees with her, just not true. Most of Tamil Nadu is non-vegetarian. So just small microaggressions like that, you hear that all the time. Oh, most Tamil people are vegetarian. but even on top of that, most people would say Tamil people don't eat pork or Tamil people don't eat beef, and that's not true either. People that we know or people that are dominant caste might not eat pork or beef, but it's actually relatively common to eat pork, for instance, um, by Hindus, um, and even beef by Hindus. So um, we see small things like this by every community to, that would definitely feel like a microaggression to other communities that feel like they can't say, I, I eat pork or I eat beef or I eat meat. Um, so that, that's just another, another thing that you see even in the media. Um, moving on, some people think that colorism is also connected to caste-based discrimination. Do you think that that is a form of caste discrimination happening without our knowledge? So I think colorism is, is a big discussion, especially in India. Um, you know, people have had campaign, campaigns against fair and lovely and all these different things uh, um, that basically, you know, are outright ways of, you know, promoting fair skin. Um, but I think colorism and casteism cannot exist without one another. Um, and I think like in my experience, um, again, growing up in America, um, whether I realized it or not, um, a lot of the media that I consumed growing up, whether it be Tamil movies or, you know, all these different things that I consumed um, in, in efforts of connecting with my culture, um, they, people were portrayed, lower caste people were always portrayed um, by darker skinned individuals. And so in, inadvertently, even though I don't intentionally carry that that uh, bias, um, there is a very, very deep connection um, um, between, you know, darker skin and lower caste. And because colorism is so um, entrenched in, in our culture, in our society, um, and both just perpetuate one another. So we, when we see someone of, of darker skin and lower caste, two things that often lead to disadvantage. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of my experience with that as well. Yeah, um, for sure. Definitely to like add on to that, I can kind of give a personal example. Um, so I do have parents that are different castes. So one of them is seen to have a lighter skin tone um, associated with their caste and one of them is not. So whenever I did visit India, like as when I was younger and all of that, like I would have cousins or individuals or family just point out, oh, you are like darker, you have a darker skin tone that might not be really associated with the cast of your mother or your father. So just having that like microaggression to you be placed as a child is like very hard to understand. And it took me a while to understand what was even going on and that it was even cast related. Um, but like Inyo, Inyo said that um, colorism and caste um, 
systems like coordinate very like and in, are very interdependent in a way like I have literally experienced that hand on hand and even here like when you randomly have a discussion of with your friends of like cast or if it bring like it's brought up they're like oh wait you're part of this cast well you don't look like you're part of this cast because you're not the skin tone um so it's really disappointing um that again this is still something so prevalent that we have to talk about but yeah All right, moving on. Um, Salamata has generally been on the forefront of the caste struggle. Do you think our parents' generation have generally upheld that in the US or have you been disappointed in our community? Uh, I guess I would say I'm disappointed in the community. I guess the parents that I've seen, people that I've been around at least. Um, I guess for me, I guess a personal example would be that I know during the 2017 Minneapolis Vietnam, so if I'm from Minnesota, so obviously I was involved in you know, doing a lot of organizing this and that. And we had tried to bring an author who had written a book about a simple like cast love story. And then what that, what happened when we had announced that this author would be coming, there was a large outroar from the Fedna community talking about you can't bring this guy, talk this and that. And it wasn't even a fact of the author or anything bad about the cast or anything like that. It was really just a fact of cast pride, or I guess in Tamil, how my dad would say this, Saudi Vedi, I guess that's how my dad would say it. And I guess that was the first real example for me in showing that just because I'm in America doesn't mean I can avoid or just like close my ears when I hear cast or even look at it. So that's, I guess, what started my whole, I guess, reading into and understanding how can I help in the cast struggle. Um. I think, yes, on one side, while there are, you know, a lot of fellow parents um, and the older generation that continues to disappoint us in such ways um, and, you know, continue to host, you know, Jadi Sangam Kutams for, you know, cast gatherings um, and things that, you know, frankly, I think in our generation, I hope that we will continue to look down upon um, and that that's not part of our value systems, that that's not what we're taught. Um, but at the same time, I will say that, um, I think credit goes to Tande Periyar um, that, you know, Tamil people do continue to be at the forefront um, of the caste struggle, whether that's within India or here. Um, I know that from my personal experience, whenever I am talking about caste, whether that's in person at college or on Facebook in a public forum, um, the people who are ready to like stand by me are very often, very often um, Tamil people. Um, and it's because they grew up in households as well, where, you know, Tande Periyar was talked about, Suya Maria Day was talked about. And so these are concepts that, you know, were constantly in the back of their minds. And so when there is a time when we see something is wrong, um, then, you know, we're more willing to be like, but that, that's not right. That is not okay. Um, and I've had several friends um, from whose parents are from other states have even said, oh my gosh, is caste like that big of a deal in Tamil Nadu? Because they don't come from homes um, where that's talked about at all. Um, for them, it's like, oh, I thought caste was something that was done and, you know, it was history. It's no longer happens. Um, but, you know, it, it continues to happen even here in America. And we explained all those examples. And, you know, when you bring it up to them, they're like, oh, wait, wow, like I didn't even know that that's happening. And so I, I hope that, you know, we continue to have this conversation amongst our community and with others outside of our community as well. I will add that the aggressiveness of non tamils on cast is kind of ridiculous. Uh, they're outright um, uh, casteists, and they will even ask you your cast a lot of times. They will ask you if you're North Indian, uh, are you not from this area? You're light skinned. Why are you from South India? Why are you Tamil? Um, and stuff like that. So from that sense, uh, I'm glad to be Tamil. We are significantly uh, more progressive in that sense, but we do have, uh, I mean, like people in Tamil Nadu still uh, come here and then they switch back to cast names as last names. That's still happening, still quite prevalent. It happens in every cast um, except for the Latinati Vazis. So there is a sense of othering there regardless. Um, but uh, these are great points. We, I, I feel like we've progressed in some ways, we've progressed in some ways, but I think overall it's been, uh, the Tamil community have been pretty, pretty progressive. Um, 
And just one Some point about the last yeah. names, to be honest, sorry, I just wanted to add um, that you mentioned uh, Adivasis and Dalits don't, and what you kind of talked about before, they can't. They, they, can't. they do not have the privilege um, of keeping the last name that they want. Of course, of course, yeah. They, have, they, they can't own it still because of them violence still in America. Um, some colleges have outlawed, outlawed caste discrimination. UC Davis, Brandeis, Colby College in Maine. Do you think more colleges and universities need to do it? So I think um, the two examples that um, Sabina actually mentioned as inspiration for our discussion today with the Cisco Systems law lawsuit in Silicon Valley um, and then the BAPS issue, um, both kind of serve as examples where um, casteism and caste discrimination have leaked into the professional world um, um, for Indian and South Asian Americans. Um, and I think like from my perspective, um, you know, caste has always been a discussion between my parents and maybe people at Thumbel class or Thumbel Sangam or something. Um, and so it was kind of appalling to see it be uh, like appear in like a professional setting. Um, and I think it serves as an example um, of, of Asian Americans or South Asian Americans, you know, allowing their bias, their, their, their casteism to, to leak again into their decisions. Um, and I think when we have such concrete examples of that, and we're aware of, you know, how prevalent it is, we just had a discussion about how prevalent it is still in our communities. Um, it is important to ensure that that doesn't affect somebody's chances at an education. Um, you know, we, we kind of talked about the disadvantage that, you know, having a low caste has in, in India when it comes to pursuit of education, pursuit of jobs. Um, and in, it would be the worst thing to allow that to also occur in America. Um, you know, once you make it America and you still have an issue being a lower caste person, having to get a job, having to get into college. Um, and so, you know, in efforts of stopping that from happening, I think it's best to create policy that makes sure that that doesn't affect someone's decision or someone's future in terms of education or um, a job. Do you guys think that any other steps should be taken as well? In addition to college? Um, I guess in addition to colleges, I mean, I guess having conversations with your friends about what they think or if they don't know about it, or at least help them educate or give them resources to learn by themselves. I guess talking with their parents, understand things, and also involving yourself in whether your college is Indian Student Association or their student councils and talk about having them bring up cast in their own organization so they can, I guess, give them an outward view of cast to people who don't even know what cast is or think that it's some outdated system doesn't affect Indians anymore. Yeah, um, to basically add on to what um, Abhitya said, it's basically just informing yourself and educating yourself on the topic itself. So you're forming your own individualized like perspective on the topic and not just carrying whatever you heard from your parents or whatever their ideas or values or perceptions are. Like it's basically creating um, your own um, idea on this topic. So really just going out of your way to educate yourself, read about it, learn about it, have those discussions. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah, along those lines, um, I also just really believe that change begins at home. And so if there are things going on in your home that you don't agree with, whether it's something your parents say, whether it's something your relatives say, um, I know it's hard. Oftentimes it's much easier to talk about these issues outside than it is within our own homes. Um, but I really think that that is where change starts. And even if it's difficult, it's being able to sum up the courage together um, to have these discussions, these difficult discussions. So within the double movie industry, we've seen a lot of uh, cast-based movies uh, recently. Jay Beam is one of them. We've seen Karnan Asudan, Pariyam Perumadam. Um, do you guys think that the movie industry has generally avoided the issue or has the double movie industry taken it head on? Well, I think um, Madhika is going to kind of talk about like the beauty of these movies and the opportunity that it serves um, for these communities. Um, but I think like one thing to note um, is uh, in in 
the Tamil movie industry, in the Indian movie industry, um, we've seen historically, maybe J-Beam has some beauty in its explicit discussion about caste, um, but there have been movies um, about, you know, underrepresented people, marginalized people, women, you know, village people, farmers, all these different things have been touched on. Um, and I think one thing that happens, um, especially as, as Americans who are watching these movies, is um, this feeling of, uh, satisfaction almost from watching the movie um, because you walk out feeling like oh I'm aware of the situation um, and and oftentimes these movies end in a happier light um, and and you a lot of people also I've seen it in you know my parents and my family friends you know walking into theater being like oh that's you know such a terrible issue and it's so sad that that happened um, but it doesn't really spark any uh, motivation to change and, and and same thing happens in India you know the mainstream Indian audience does watch these movies but they walk right by the things that are happening um, and you know you know to touch on you know specifically cast um, like for example you know recent movie discussed the Irulal, Irulal, um community which which you know you might find some solace in the fact that that took place 25 years ago in 1995 but those people didn't make it out of india um you know majority of um indian americans asian south asian americans are of higher caste um and so those problems still exist those people are still undocumented they still don't have ballots they still don't have representation and so all of those things are it, it's, it's while it is um as madhavika is going to talk about like important to portray those voices in mainstream media um, it, it's not exact, exactly the full um, solution. And, and like Aditya and Bharati talked about, there are important steps that we need to take um, to educate ourselves and try to uh, inspire change. Yes, completely agree with what Anil said. Um, you know, it's, it's about what we do when we leave the theaters after seeing these movies, right, that really matter. Um, but I do think that um, it is very, um, I, I think for a long time um, in Indian cinema um, overall and in Tamil cinema, um, there was not very much room for these stories. And even if these stories were shared, they were shared by other upper caste people shedding light um, on these you know, unique stories. But I think for the first time, um, really, I have to say the first time ever you see directors um, who are coming from these communities um, and being able to strongly, um, you know, share their stories. I mean, you know, Karnan is by no mean, you know, a, a story where it's just like, I'm going to talk about this lightly, like he really goes for it. And so, um, and these are movies that are not just, you know, critically acclaimed, but they're commercially successful movies. And I think that's really important um, that, you know, it means that the audience is welcoming these movies. And so I hope more and more directors and producers and actors and actresses from these communities um, rise up. Um, and I, I do also want to say that um, after J Beam, actually, um, one good thing, um, Inyel, to you mentioned the Irul community, um, Irular community, um, uh, the uh, chief minister of Tamil Nadu actually, um, Stalin actually gave um, patas, um, which are land certificates, um, to 33, um, 33 Irula families. Um, after the movie J Beam release, so I mean, again, you know, tip of the iceberg, long way to go. But you know, these these movies are having you know at least a little bit of a stone and ripple effect. Um, yeah. And and just to add on, we've, we've been getting more and more of these stories, and we're getting better representation uh, amongst the Dalit and Adivasi community. But they're still highly underrepresented. Um, within the film industry, within the media, within most things. Um, even if people want to make it seem like, you know, they, they have reservations, they're getting all these positions, they don't. Most of the powerful positions are not, maybe politics, but outside of that, not really. Um, do you guys have any uh, recommendations for resources um, for people that are listening in right now? Where to learn more? So I think like one thing um, we've we've been doing it throughout our discussion um, is, you know, the comparison between um, some of the race struggles that we have here in the States um, and, and the caste issues that we have um, in South India. And I think a big uh, part of hearing the story, I mean, even today, you know, we're having this discussion, um, but we're not people who've, you know, truly experienced it firsthand. And so, you know, you have to invite people 
um, um, to your to your uh, resources, expose yourself to people who've experienced these things firsthand. Um, and so like, I remember last year, I, I heard an NPR, um, like a little informational session um, that included a speaker named Sura Chiangda, um, who is a, a Dalit who from India made it to the States, got an education, got a PhD from Harvard. Um, and now he serves as a scholar on cast for, at Harvard. And, you know, he publishes and he takes his time to speak on things. Um, and people like that who have, you know, the academic background and who've done, you know, their research and their work, um, who can also speak on their experiences, I feel like are kind of the best sources to go to um, when it comes to like really personalizing these things and figuring out you know how it might even appear in your own community and i guess to add there's this book that i read that helped me kind of understand the caste struggle a lot in terms of that when growing up we only learned about the african-american struggle in like high school even in college almost so there's this book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, and she's like an African-American author. And the book was on the Oprah's book club, I think 2020. And it basically, it just illustrates how the African-American struggle is so similar to adult struggle or the lower caste struggle. I mean, with things like in adult Panthers, which really resembles, you know, the Black Panthers a lot. So I guess this book really helps kids who are in high school or in college or just starting to learn about caste. I think it's the best resource as a book, at least to understand the struggle. And to add on, I think going and checking out the Equality Labs and their website, they have a lot of, they're the only uh, group that does any uh, research on caste in America and North America. Um, they have a lot of harem statistics about actually what the other and Adi people go through in, in America and the type of discrimination that they face, um, including the violence that they face in America. Um, highly recommend that. I would also recommend uh, Annihilation of Caste by Ambedkar. Uh, great book uh, based obviously in India, but it gives a really good perspective of how they both broke through uh, originally to uh, get the beginning of, of some type, some version of freedom. Uh, I think with that, if everybody is done, um, I think that's the end of this conversation. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their uh, viewpoints and everything. Um, very insightful. And I want to thank everybody for listening in. Thanks.